That's mine. So, my dear croissant army, welcome back to Opus L and I, where we make outfits whether or not we're going to events. You may all remember the block printed tunic that I made a while ago for my partner's knitting, and if you don't, you should go watch that video because I am inordinately proud of it. Well, when pandemic things started to look up, the event at which the knitting would take place was rescheduled, and I realized that I don't actually have anything dressy and appropriate to wear. I've been wanting to make more late 14th century clothing to fill in some holes in my wardrobe, and this event, if it actually can happen safely, is the perfect excuse. The 14th century upper class feminine silhouette was characterized by dresses that were form fitting in the sleeves and torso and then flared into full skirts at the hip. Dresses were laced at the front or side or button closed down the front, and the ones with long sleeves had buttons along the lower arm to allow for a tight fitting sleeve to slide over the hand. These kinds of dresses go by many names both in period and modernly. Kirtle, coat, tunic, gown, coat hardy, gothic fitted dress, among other terms. I usually end up calling it a coat hardy to differentiate it from other historical styles. My goal with this outfit is to make something that will coordinate well with my partner's tunic but not overshadow it while filling a hole in my existing wardrobe. A 14th century little black dress, if you will. So I'm going to go dig in my stash for some black linen, grab some pretty silver buttons, and brew up another cup of tea. Today's offering is a perennial favorite, Harney and Sons vanilla with a touch of cream. And let's get into it. I'm starting from an old coat hardy pattern that I had fitted to me a few years ago, which is the blue pattern pieces with the square neckline. Since my body has changed shape over the course of the pandemic, I'll need to repattern the body just a bit in addition to changing the neckline. I'm going to make a mock-up with this pattern but leave large seam allowances in case I need to let them out or mark where seam line should be. I'll be cutting out a mock-up from the leftover orange linen from when I made my 18th century pumpkin butt. Tell me you have a new camera and don't completely know how to use it without telling me that you have a new camera and don't completely know how to use it. I promise it gets better. I'm just still getting used to how quickly the focus shifts. I probably should have done this fitting with no whiskey grandpa shirt underneath it, but I wasn't entirely thinking about it, and since I'll be wearing a shift underneath anyway, I think it will be okay.
I'm just going to go ahead and mark the front center line where I have it pinned together and want the buttons to sit, and mark on the sides where I want to let it out just a little bit at the loop. Other than that though, I'm pretty happy with it. First things first, I'm going to cut out the refitted lining. I'm tracing along the stitching line and I will add seam allowances when I cut this out. That should make it easier to get a very accurate stitching line later. Normally when I make a 14th century dress, the front and back are rectangular from the hips down and then the triangular gores are added to the front sides and back to make the fullness of the skirt. This pattern has triangular gores already incorporated into the skirt pattern however, which sometimes makes it easier to cut and sometimes more difficult. I often have to piece the bottom corners of the skirt as you will see here. Because of how the dress pattern was laid out on this length of fabric, I had to cut the back seam straight down from the small of my back. So here I am cutting two triangular gores which will be added at the center back of each piece.
I'm piecing together the corners of the skirt panels before I start assembling the dress. I'll sew these together and then serge the seam allowances because I want them to be treated as one piece. Before I sew the lining and dress panels together, I'll serge the edges of each panel separately rather than sewing them together and then finishing the seam another way, whether that's by serging or felling. This will finish the seam pieces while still allowing for relatively easy alteration later in case my body changes further. After the dress and panel linings are each sewn up, it's time to put them all together. I'm leaving the front skirt seam open for now to make things easier as I sew the neckline and front button plackets together. As it turned out, the neckline was just a little bit higher than I wanted it to be when I tried it on briefly, so I marked the new lower neckline before sewing along that line and trimming the excess away. Then I will clip the neckline curves, turn the lining right side out, and iron those seams nice and flat. quick interlude that I forgot to film, I sewed the sleeves and linings together, forming the button placket at the outside edge of the lower arm and the tubular upper sleeve. I then serged the sleeve and lining together at the arm side, making a finished sleeve head. Once that was done, I sewed the sleeve into the body along the seam line I drew earlier, marking where the arm side cuts uncomfortably into my shoulder. Once the sleeve is in, I'll trim the arm side seam allowance down to about a quarter of an inch, leaving the edges unfinished. Then I can fold the serged sleeve head over and whip stitch it down. This will allow me to easily unpick the sleeve in case I need to alter the side seams later.
Stay tuned after this brief commercial break for the last two steps of dress construction and then the final reveal. The next big step for this dress is the buttons and buttonholes. To mark the buttonholes, I'll start half an inch from the neckline and make marks every inch all the way down the front, leaving me a half inch at the bottom as well. Then I will mark the sleeve plackets the same way. Once all the button holes are sewn, I'll use my nice authentic hand forged picking tool and my very inauthentic self healing cutting mat to cut open the button holes. After that, I need to try on the dress one more time so I can pin it shut and mark where the placket overlap should fall. Then I can mark where the buttons need to be sewn. I'm using a heavy duty button thread double to sew on these metal buttons. All 33 buttons. I'm going to be here for a while.
After that, the only thing left to do is the hem. While I had the dress on earlier, I also marked some points along the edge of the dress where it just hits the floor. I'll lay out the whole dress on the floor, the table is still not quite big enough for this, and with the help of production assistant Bran, mark a smooth curve connecting those points. Cutting the hem on that line and sewing a double folded half inch hem will put the bottom of the dress just above floor length and since I have a bad habit of tripping over my dresses, this will likely save me injury and embarrassment, but not at the cost of elegance at any event I happen to go to. We have arrived at the end of yet another project. 
It really felt good wading back into the 14th century again. It's been a while and I missed it. I'm really very pleased with my altered pattern. Both the fit and the neckline turned out exactly as I wanted them to. I still don't know if I'll get to wear it to an event anytime soon as COVID precautions and keeping tornadoes safe take precedence over any other considerations. I look forward to the day when I can properly show it off in person though. In upcoming news, Costume Symposium is only two weeks away. The schedule of videos, panels, and social media events is now available, and I will make sure to link that in the description. I will be releasing a premiere video on assembling a Viking capsule wardrobe on Friday at my regularly scheduled time. And I'll be hosting a panel here on Opus LNI on the topic of medieval costuming on Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern, along with Faye Sterling, Daisy Victoria, Rose Cottage Notions, Ilva the Red, The Welsh Viking, and Kezia's Envy Cosplay. I'll also be participating in Daisy Victoria's Renaissance costuming panel over on her channel at 3 p.m. Eastern on Sunday. And I'll make sure to link the schedule and all of those participants in the description. For more information and updates, you can follow Cozy on Instagram and Facebook too. The second tournament of defense is coming up in November, and I will be working hard on that after Kosi is finished. We are also very quickly approaching 5,000 subscribers, which I mentioned in the last video, and since we hit 4,725 subscribers between then and now, I thought I would show you a sneak peek of the 18th century anatomical heart pockets I made for the giveaway. I can't wait to send them to their new home. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button and be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. I upload every other Friday and you can click on the little notification bell if that's your jam. If you would like to find me on other social media, I am at Opus LNI everywhere and all of those links will be down in the description box below, along with a link to my Ko-fi which has exclusive content for donors and my web shop where I have some medieval sundries listed if you would like to help support the channel more directly. Until next time, be kind, do the work, continue supporting marginalized people, and keep creating. Well. Okay. Next time I'm putting vodka in this, not tea.